Hello and welcome to the St. Louis Online. I'm Pete Smith, co-chairman of the 40th National Narrow Gauge Convention Planning Committee. The video you are about to watch is part of a series of clinics and layout tours presented as a virtual but slimmed down version of our narrow gauge convention, which had to be canceled due to the coronavirus. We thank all of our presenters for their support and for allowing us to share their work with you. Our thanks also to Russ Segner, Robin Peel, and Burr Stewart for producing this series. For more information on this video and others, go to our website at 40ngc.com. We hope you enjoy the program that follows. <laughs> Hmm. The guy last week that was on doing the, did a great clinic on lighting, gave a chat, said, very great work, very informative, thanks. Oh, that's nice. wonder if you'll get one from Kim. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I wouldn't hold my, I wouldn't hold my breath. You might see if he's on there. You uh, list stuff, you know, you can scroll down through the... Yeah, I mean, send Russ a... For all your help, kind of thing. That water thing that guy did looked like it was very. It, he'd had some great looking water. I took a lot of notes. I'm going to transcribe them. I took the liberty of uh, sharing this. Uh, any of you recognize this? Was this up in Seattle? Yes. Been there. It's wonderful. That's Sam's house, right? That's Sam's, Sam Furukawa's layout yep. in Kirkland. Beautiful. He posted this this morning. I'm not sure we'd describe it as a house. It's more a model railroad room with a bedroom attached. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Is this still in operation or is this gone? No, no, this is gone. Um, Bill Banta and Jimmy Booth came up and uh, he and I, the, the two of them and I and Fred Hamilton dismantled it, boxed three of the big sections of it into a, uh, a container and it was shipped to Japan. Wow. It's I'll say that. 
Russ, is he rebuilding this in Japan, or is he using that it was to build a new layout? That was the plan. Uh, but the last I had heard, it was still in a warehouse because it takes a while in Tokyo to get a, a permit for the home he was going to build. But now he's uh, he's uh, suffered some re you know reverses health wise, yeah. and I'm not sure what the status is. But fortunately, Sam took a lot of video, and of course, a lot of us have a lot of video of his layout. And so it's just fun to go through the old files, old videos, and relive the experience. I think if he needed volunteers from the U.S. to go to Japan and help him, he'd get a few. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So many thousands of hours of work. <clears throat> Now, as soon as this finishes, which will be very shortly, we'll get back to uh, to the real show. Russ, I uh, talked to Fred Hill yesterday, who seems to be able to do contact with Sam. And, you know, Sam fell and he's had an operation on his knee. Yes. And then there were some other complications. So he's not out of the woods yet. Yeah, that's my understanding. That's why I suggest, uh, well, I'm good to know that Fred is in touch. Um, we ought to figure out some way to send him a get well card. I, I may have a mailing address for him. Would you post it to me and uh, we'll put it up on the website. Our next presenter is uh, Jerry Cornwell, who's going to take us on a tour, I think, of Fast Tracks. So, Jerry, you're up. Thanks, Russ. So here we have a video we took uh, a week ago um, at the shop. Uh, with Tim Morris is giving a tour of the shop and uh, explaining how we actually uh, make a strip wood. Products are produced from either white pine or basswood. Uh, we use white pine for all our railroad That's guides, good. basswood to produce our strip wood and sheets. Typically, we have quite a big pile of it here, but we're a bit on the low side. Uh, we bring this in from a local supplier. Uh, we order about a thousand board feet at a time, and it comes in rough cut. Kiln dry, um, and from there we work it all the way through to the finished products that, uh, that we sell. So, in addition to pine and basswood, we also use a lot of plywood. The plywood is used for the fast tracks products, quick sticks, sweep sticks, various things like that. We bring it in uh, two or three times a year. We have a skid flown in from Finland, uh, know where they produce it. And it's quite heavy. It's about six, seven hundred pounds for these skids, so we have uh, to move this stuff around. All right, the first step in uh, making either strips or sheets is we take our raw boards and cut them to length. We have a, a real old and deep Sears craftsman regular arms on, which is ideally suited for that job. It's hard to cut these wide boards on chop saws or it's impossible. Regular arm, you can lay the board down. Slide it through. And just use a simple stop block to uh, adjust the length either to 16 inch or 24 inch pieces. So from there, we take uh, the rough boards and run them through a plane. So we need to have uh, one smooth side if we're doing sheets and both sides smooth if we're going to cut it down. And we just use a, an off the shelf wall planer, works great. Run them until they die and then we buy another one. For cutting strips, uh, we have a programmable gang saw. What do you call this thing? The big machine. The big machine. <laughs> <laughs> so for cutting strips, we use this machine uh, that we lovingly call the big machine for lack of another name. Uh, 
it's a twin blade programmable saw. So we can program uh, how thick of a slice of wood we want to cut off from these boards. It cuts very precisely the whole tolerance down the road. When it's running, it just goes back and forth, feeds down, so it cuts off slices. When it gets to the bottom, it already raises itself up and stops. As, it's, as we're cutting, we'll be doing quality checks through uh, the product the whole time it's cutting and uh, make sure that the sizes are what we want and what the quality is what we want. So the big saw will produce these strips. We call them flats. Uh, these are they're all cut to the thickness of the wood that we need to cut into the strips. So this will be the height of the wood. Then it goes on to this machine. This is a, a very cool machine and does a bulk of our work. Uh, it's a gang sock, so it has a variety of blades that we put in it that are built up uh, to cut a specific size. Uh, the wood is simply fed into the, into the saw. It's got a set of roll, uh, feed rollers and pulls the wood through. That's very precisely again. To, uh, the when using this machine, we do a lot of uh, quality checking because Probably about 30 to 40% of the wood is rejected. We try to keep it the high level. So the gang saw blades are built up for all the popular sizes that we produce. The chart here shows all the combinations of wood thicknesses for each of those. The saws are built up onto an arbor with multiple blades. Each blade has a spacer in between it that uh, we can adjust to get the thickness that we want. This is the bulk of the value of the company is right there in these blades. These things cost a small fortune each. Each blade is about $75. And it doesn't so We're cutting sheets, our basswood sheets that we do in four and six inch coats. We start by resawing material on this Delta bandsaw. This bandsaw has been heavily reworked um, with custom equipment added to it. It allows us to program the thickness that we want the sheets to be cut to. It has a, a vacuum suction table that it works incredibly well. You take a piece of wood, stick it to the table, turn it on, it sucks the wood tight up against it and it cannot come off. Program how thick we want the sheets, leaving some extra material on to sand down sheets to get more size. So we just let it run. Top away from the So once the sheets have been resawn on the bandsaw, we sand them down to size on belt sand. If we're doing dimensional sheets, we will sand them to the final size on here. Sand them down pretty accurately to about one thirty second fit. If we're going to use the sheets for the shaped material, we only sand one side, uh, so we'll stick to a suction table and we shape the other side. So the final step in doing uh, adding a profile to these sheets is this shaper. Again, it's a heavily built custom made machine that does just that job. It does it quite well. The sheets are held onto a suction table, the same like you were on the bandsaw. It's a very solid and it's the fed through the shaper. It's a very loud machine, so we have to get lots of people operating it. It's, it's pretty fascinating to watch. Uh, it's responsible for filling up our dust collector more than anything else we do
So this is Murphy, this is the dust collector. It gathers up uh, as much dust as we can throw into it. One thing that we produce here in Albert is uh, sawdust and scrap wood in greater quantities. So, uh, course of a couple of days, we'll fill two 50 gallon barrels with sawdust. They have to be manually dumped into a dumpster. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, I, I, I would I would stick to cutting wood and not pretending to be a dustman. You got that right. <laughs> you could, it's a good thing he's young. <laughs> oh, that's got, great. Anybody that anybody that does woodworking will understand some of the issues there, and the dust is is certainly one of them. <clears throat> I love it. If anybody have any questions? I just said that it looks like there's a lot of labor goes into making a single piece of scriptwork. Yeah, I think you're right. That there is a lot of labor involved. It's um, there. It's it's a difficult business to automate. Much we've done, I think, as much as we can, um, but it is fairly labor intensive. And the other thing, uh, somebody pointed out, you, uh, it's a it's a sawdust factory, uh, which has uh, strip wood as an accidental byproduct, and that's pretty much true. Is it? Uh, uh, Sixty or seventy percent of the wood gets turned into sawdust because of the kerf on the blades, right? If I'm cutting an uh, an O scale uh, one inch board, that's twenty one thou. Well, the blade cutting that is 62 thou. So for every cut that I make, I'm cutting, I'm only getting 30% uh, efficiency out of that. So, um, and then that's only one cut. You've also got to cut the other direction. So there's, a, there's an uh, incredible amount of waste involved uh, with uh, an, almost all of it sawdust. <laughs> I think there's possibly a market for a lot of that reject I saw go into that trash tub. We used to we do that at shows. Uh, we we have in the past sold uh, seconds at shows where we bundle them up. Um, we don't we don't sort them by size or anything else. We just put a bundle in a in a uh, about a, a one pound bundle of wood and uh, sell them at the at the shows. But that's the only way we offer that. And the question about new kits coming out? Yes, we do have a few new kits coming out. Uh, there's both an HO and an, and an O scale kit in the works, and they're both very close to uh, to coming out. To, uh, to being available. So uh, uh, keep, keep an eye on our website. I do want to share one more thing uh, before I move on to the next uh, presentation. Wait, I don't see it. I'm Jerry Cornwell from Mount Albert Scale Lumber, and I'd like to introduce you to an exciting new tool of the workshop. The most impressive structures on a model railroad are timber structures like trestles, trusses, wharfs, and snowsheds. They're also the most challenging to build. The challenge is to build a straight and plumb structure, like this one. Ultimation, a new tool company, started by the founder of Mount Albert Scale Lumber, has combined the latest in machine tools and industrial lasers with model building skills to produce the Ultimation Sander. The Ultimation Sander makes it possible to get great results like this, shown on a Hunterline Snowshed kit. This kit requires over 700 precise angle cuts. You get tight, precise square joints every time. It features repeatable accuracy within one half of a degree. The rubber disc edge allows fingertip control. It can sand to one one thousandth of an inch accuracy. And a double ball bearing stainless steel hand crank guarantees friction free operation. It uses self-adhesive, easy-to-change, five-inch sanding discs with different grits available. 
the ultimation sander and your creativity a great modeling team or yours today <laughs> hello again since that last video was shot the inventor of the automation sander has come up with another great tool which really extends the usefulness of this tool for making repeated uh, sizes of different uh, shapes of wood particularly angle pieces which are so hard to do on a piece like this so i'd like to introduce the founder of mount albert scale lumber and the inventor of the automation sander, Mr. Al Collins. I guess a number of you are familiar with our little <laughs> sander, which seems to have had great reviews and has become quite popular in the hobby. It, uh, it has the ability to make any piece uh, accurate, 100% accurate, within half a degree and within a thousandth of an inch. The problem is when you get into a kit such as uh, this one, and I keep picking on Rick Hunter's snowshoe because there is an actual fact 750 angles in that kit. Here typically is one of the bends, and you can see how many angles there are in here. This particular piece here has four different angles on it. So to reproduce those and get a nice structure, um, starting off with a jig, and there's that little piece I was just showing you. And there are three more of those pieces, which are exactly the same lengthwise and angle-wise. So I'll just demonstrate quickly what I've come up with or what we've come up with. It's an attachment. We call it the repeater. And it's simply a matter of removing basically one bolt on the sander. The knob comes off. So now we've added the repeater, simply uh, one screw here, loosened, put back on, replace this quadrant with the quadrant on the repeater, the angles and everything line up exactly. So if we look at these pieces, as you can see, again, are 100% accurate. They're one of the cross braces that go in this kit. Very simple matter of producing the first one, and we'll cause it call it a sample or a template. This one's a little long. We can put it in the repeater. Make sure you get the angle on the right way. And we've decided we want to take a bit off. So whatever gap we leave in here is the amount we want to take off. It holds itself in and it's self heat And if you expand it, It'll stop sanding, it comes to the stop, and it should be. Exactly the same. Same length, same angle. Once this is set, and I'll backtrack just a little bit. If you want to fine tune that, this little neural knob is one thousandth of an inch radiations. So if you wanted to just make it not a little shorter, you can adjust it like so. Put the piece back in. Oop. Comes. Touch it up and literally take the thousands of an inch off. Once that's set, now you can take and make as many pieces as you want, exactly the same length and exactly the same angle, so you can go and start assembling. And as you can see, everyone will fit the same. The result, this is only a fairly small portion. I think there's a picture already. But as you can see, they're exact. Because O scale is my favorite scale, the demonstrations I've done so far are all in O scale. This is the same thing, the same kit, and very similar angles in HO with the same results. Outstanding. I, now, believe, I believe we have Al Collins online if anyone has any questions. I would just say it's the best money I've ever spent, Al. Thank uh, you. 
Thank you. At Sacramento, I tried to spend money, but you were out of them. Are you? Have you got good supply right now? I've got uh, close to 200 in stock. I just did finish a big run, so I got lots. Great. And Me too. I'm going to agree with that also. It's almost impossible to build a model without it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So is there a trick to mounting the, the sanding disc to the tool? Because uh, the first time I tried it, my disc didn't stick well and it kind of wobbled on and off. Um, that's a catch 22. Those are, those discs are designed for the auto body industry. So they're pressure sensitive adhesive and they like obviously they like pressure if we if we put anything with any more serious glue on it and you're faced with trying to clean the glue off if you if you just wipe the disc um, with a little bit of lacquer thinner or something first make sure there's no set sawdust on it press it straight on as soon as you start using it um, it won't come off the biggest the biggest the biggest problem is getting sawdust between the disc and the, and the sanding disc So, um, uh, Al, I'm, I'm new to looking at this. It look, I, I'm actually enjoying learning how to work with wood. Uh, it's a purely manual machine, right? It's just that little hand crank, so you have complete control. It's not powered at all, right? It's simple. Uh, so you've got the you've yeah. got the hand crank, and then mm -hmm. you've got the rubber edge on the disc. It's a metal disc, but there's an inlaid rubber edge. So literally, you yes, can, you can, you can really use finesse thumb. it, and you can go back and forward too. And it really can take a thousandth of an inch off of. Someone else said they were anal, so <laughs> anal too. I think you've got 156 that meet that category on this call right now. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Does the dust collect in the bottom of this, like in sort of an enclosure? Nope. No. So, okay, so uh, it's not. You need to have some sort of a containment on your workbench to collect material. You don't make enough dust to really worry about. Uh, okay. Not like a power sander that creates a ton of dust. Mm -hmm. it, uh, because it's so slow moving, there's very little dust created. So what's a steady supply of these discs in various grades? In the, uh, in the, in the box, you get a part number for Norton and 3M. They're a common, any auto body, Napa, UAP, they sell them. They're just, uh, they're an industrial grade disc but they're a five inch and they come in all different grades. Tim sells them too. You can buy them direct online from Fast Tracks or you can get them. Like I say, I've included the part numbers. So you just go to Napa down there and say you want some of these. I think Norton sells them in five packs. You can buy them online. You can buy a hundred for like 35 bucks. So get a hold of Chuck and a couple other guys and buy a hundred, split them up. So hey, yes, I, 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 I see you have the 120 grit ones on your on the Fast Tracks website. I, 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 I put the 120 on. It, it works really well. Tim uses them a lot at Fast Tracks for, for sanding his uh, castings for the frogs and things he makes. It works on brass, styrene, wood. <laughs> Say, Al? Yeah. When, when you, um, is the, do you have to clamp that down or is the frame heavy enough so it doesn't move around while you're turning it? You would need to clamp it down. Um, actually, if, if you take a look, you'll see there's two square holes in the base. You can put a carriage bolt in. But normally just a clamp, just to clamp it to the edge of your desk or your workbench. Because you can't hold it, you need the other hand to hold the wood. So we put a very thick piece of plywood and, and screwed it onto the piece of plywood and then put rubber feet on the plywood. Yeah. It's right on top of the glass and works really well. Yeah. Just, right. it's not, it, there's not enough weight in the actual thing to hold it. it, it will bounce around. You need to clamp it or put it on a base, a bigger base. Great product. Oh, thank you. Okay, are we, uh, are there any more questions? Because uh, this is the chance to ask the vendors, the guys that know what, the, how it's done. Uh, I got a question for them. Does the uh, whole slide that holds the piece of wood fit on the existing arc uh, piece or is it a whole replacement? It's a whole replacement piece. That's the easiest way to do it. You just have to take the one screw out that, that holds the 
protractor on and put the new one on, the, the arrows line up, the gauge, everything lines up almost perfectly. Okay, great. Very, Thanks. very simple. Very simple. Uh, so what, what's, what's the typical length of the material you can handle in that protractor? Uh, since O scale is where you should be, it'll take uh, just over six inches, which is about 30 feet in O scale. So that'll handle O scale, S scale, and HO. Okay. Um, and you can, I can make longer ones. So I think it's just under 12 inches because that fits in the box. But that's right. what I went with. I went with 30 feet in O scale as a starting point because no matter what I do, it'll be too long or too short. So, but I can make longer ones um, for guys that are in, you know, G or. or Same so. price or you, you want a custom price bill? No, I, I, I would send that act afterwards just as an add-on. To be honest, I haven't been asked for one yet. Well, actually, I think maybe Chuck Lind asked for one and I never sent it to him. All right. Well, thank again, thank you, uh, Jerry and Al. Excellent products. Good service. All right, Alan, uh, you're on. Okay. Um, originally, I was asked or told I could have some time. I'm going to give you two blatant commercials. And then I'll talk about the uh, Narrow Gauge uh, Preservation Foundation. I am dedicating this clinic to uh, the John Kalen computer skills techniques. It's called an analog power point. And that, here's my first screen for fun and games. Uh, the, the, we're offering uh, 10% discount if you go to the Fun and Games website, uh, scalefigures.com. I'll type this into the chat after I get done. Um, the second company, Missouri Locomotive Company. <laughs> the only thing I'm going to talk to you about, the Missouri Locomotive Company, uh, we've never done this before, but I'm going to give you a sneak preview of uh, this is our new locomotive, the pilot models being built in Korea. This specific model was uh, scratch built or cobbled together by Jim Barron. Many of you, he was, was my partner. He passed away earlier this year. So that's got a website, moloco.biz, M-O-L-O-C-O dot biz. And I'll, again, I'll type this in. And then the, uh, the main reason I'm here is to talk about the Narragate Preservation Foundation. Um, I'm gonna try to go through this quickly. All of this information is on the website, which is www.vthengpf.org. Uh, this group was founded in 2000 is the Narrow Gauge Trust. The original people were Sam Farakawa, Bob Brown, Fred Hill, Fred Hamilton, and Bob Hayden. Uh, in 2014, it was converted to the Narrow Gauge Preservation Foundation, and Jimmy Booth came on as a board member at some point in there. This is, uh, we are a 501c3 uh, Elia Mosnery group, so any donations are tax deductible. I took over for Charlie Getz when he retired as the executive director, and the board consists of Jimmy Booth as the chair, Bob Stadt as the vice chair, Richard Rance as the treasurer, uh, Fred Hill continues as a board member, along with Steve Frediani, another SN3 modeler, and Lindsay Rayleigh, who uh, happens to be an SN3 modeler. Uh, one thing I would like to tell you all, if I am late in getting back to you to acknowledge a donation or a dues payment, the problem is, is that due to the pandemic, I thought it'd be a good idea to have the post office box mailed to my street address. Uh, little did I know that that causes about a three-week delay 
because anything going to the post office is shipped off to Indianapolis where it goes through a machine and puts that yellow sticker on it with my street address and then it's shipped back. And it's pretty low priority mail. So it takes about three weeks from when you mail it. Uh, and then it goes through the process to get put on my street address. Um, the activities of the foundation are funded totally by dues for uh, membership dues and donations. We do receive some donations that the person prefers not to be a member, but typically the uh, members, uh, everybody joins as a member. Um, all of the grants that this group approves tend to be matching grants. And the last time I added it up, I think there's been way over a million dollars granted since the time this uh, group was first founded. Uh, but most of those grants are matching. So the people requesting assistance have to do their own fundraising to get uh, to meet our grant amounts that's been approved. Um, the group started with charter membership in 2014, have about a 75% uh, retention. The um, general membership starts at $45 and for all new members get a copy of Sam's uh, video, the Cumbers and Toltec Scenic Railroad from Trackside. And that we also retail these at about $20. We also carry all of Sam's books, excuse me, all of Sam's books, which are available through Bob Hayden and his, uh, at his website. Uh, a portion of everybody's dues goes to the preservation effort also. There are sustaining memberships for $150, corporate memberships are 90, and there's a newsletter that comes out when I can get it out and get enough information to fill it. Or we attempt to try to do four newsletters a year. Uh, past projects that this group has participated in include the K27 number 463, the PBL Chama layout, which was uh, at the Chama Interpretive Center and has now been moved to San Francisco and will become part of the NMRA's exhibit at the California Railroad Museum. Uh, the turntable at the Colorado Railroad Museum, Ardenwood, California car barn, Tweetsie, uh, trucks for rolling stock, the EBD, e, sorry, EBT hoppers for the ballast service on the CNTS. Uh, SP narrow gauge number 18, which I had the privilege to ride behind the day it blew its cylinder just outside of Durango. Denver and Rio Grande number 169, uh, several model collections and book libraries that have been donated to the group. Uh, Rio Grande Southern number 20, which uh, has just been put back on the rails under power. The T12 number 168 was moved to Antonito. Uh, several award-winning half-inch scale models. Uh, the repair of the SPC depot roof, Como rail yard restoration project, number 168's tender. Uh, some funding for SP number 18, inaugural operation, and the CNTS Railroad Rotary OY. Current projects include the South Park Rail Society's uh, the Colorado and Southern Heritage Boxcar Preservation Project, uh, South Park Rail Society's restoration of Denver and Rio Grande Western stock car number 5743, we donated the Joe Murphy collection of 716 scale model locomotives and cards to the South Park Rail Society for 
a permanent display in their uh, museum. Uh, Waynes, Waynesburg and Washington in Pennsylvania, new engine house floor so they can refurbish, I think it's number four. And also they're working on a passenger coach and the Nevada County Narrow Gauge Railroad Museum restoration of West Side Snowplow number two. Uh, the list is vast and the resources are limited. Your help is solicited to help us continue this cause to preserve the narrow gauge. Um, we have had to turn down projects because of the, the funding. Uh, how you can help in this effort, you can be a member, as I've stated, for 45 bucks a year. You make a tax deduction donation, tax deductible donation as we are, a, uh, Ilya Mosnery group, support the projects and tell others about the NGPF. Uh, together we'll work toward in the future to preserving the significant narrow gauge prototypes that are we all model. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions of Alan? This is, you know, part and parcel of how we keep this thing alive. Do you send out um, reminders for the uh, dues, Alan? I do. Okay. Yeah, there's, uh, it's about four times a year. I'll do a quarter or three month cycle of dues, reminding people of the dues notice. Good. So, Alan, uh, did you say you were going to put the address on the chat thingy? Uh, I will as soon as uh, PBL gets started. I'll go ahead and put the websites on the chat. And it's going to be coming. For some reason, it says me. It doesn't say Alan on the when I put a comment. So me is Alan. That's just because you're looking at you, so it says that you are me. But when we see you, we see Alan. Okay. Yeah. See, that tells you how much I know about this computer stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, and just uh, keep well away from it, please. <laughs> My tech savvy son is uproariously laughing right now, Alex. <laughs> I'm not Alan, on the uh, keyboard. You, you can see my hand. No cards? Alan, uh, did you take checked or credit cards or what's your uh, best uh, form, of, form of payment? Uh, we can take uh, credit cards, PayPal, or check. Any way you can transmit money, except I can't take Apple Pay. I have no idea how to do that. All right, Alan, thank you again for your time that's spent doing this. You know, guys, uh, all of us are volunteers one way or the other in this hobby. And candidly, uh, this is the only way it's going to stay alive is that we can convince ourselves to keep at it and try to recruit some other guys uh, into the activity uh, by being as. Uh, outgoing and as positive as we can about what's going on in the hobby. So that's my soapbox speech for the morning. Bill and Jimmy, are you guys up? Yeah. Well, welcome uh, from uh, Smoky, California. Well, we've had a heck of a week. We've had power outages. Uh, we actually lost power to our well, so we had no water. Uh, I had no power to my shop or home. And then to top it off, we had no Wi-Fi up until about an hour and a half ago. So we didn't even know if we could give this presentation. So last night we decided to uh, make a video presentation in case we had to send it to Russ instead of doing it live. So uh, we'll go ahead and, and roll that presentation. And if you have any questions afterwards, uh, we'll be happy to answer them for you. So uh, Robin, you give me share the screen privilege. Hey, Jimmy. I guess we're going to be on Zoom today because uh, Russ told us we had to show what people what's going on here. What do you think? Yeah, well, we're going to show everybody what's new here at PBL, but we're certainly uh, sorry that we all couldn't meet together at the Narrow Gauge Convention and show you everything in person, but this is the next best thing for right now, and so we'll look forward to uh, showing you what we're doing at the PBL shops. Great, you know, I, we, I was going to mention too, this is our kitchen, so <laughs> everybody, everybody, we're, we're all together in this, I guess, huh? Yeah, only you don't get to smell the green chili and we do. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, so, so what do we have, Bill? 
Well, we got all kinds of stuff, you know. We introduced some of these models a while back. We said we we're going to do these things, but it takes a while to make get the tooling right. And of course, that's what we're looking at here is tooling. So let's we'll start. Let's start with the Perlite car, which is this car here. And uh, this is the tool that this, this part comes out of. Well, this is the one-piece brake shot, Jim. I'm trying to hold it so maybe you can see it against the black. It's uh, it's an interesting part. It's got a lot of different things on it here. I'll show you a little bit about it. It's a two-piece part because this part, you know, is too long for the mold. But that part goes on here and goes that way. See, like this way. And ends up looking like this. See, can you see that? Yeah, it looks great. Well, this, this part here, the reason why it's that way is because this chain has to hang down like this. I don't know if it's going to vibrate on me, but um, anyway, that fits underneath the car, which is like this. And this is, this, in the old, the early kits, this was the one, this was a part, these are all separate parts. This was a lever, and it has clevises on it. See the clevises here? And, uh, it also has these brass wires to connect all of this together, and the hangers are here, if you can see that. So, at my age, I don't want to have to do this anymore. These things were hard to do. Yeah, I agree. It took about an hour and a half to do one of those underbodies, but now we can do it in five minutes with that one-piece brake shot. Yeah, it's a, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty cool part, and the fact that we were able to tool it and make it and it actually works is amazing. You can see how it fits on there like this. Even the chain is is there, fits inside the the bottom bottom. Um, I'll get it. What is that thing? Come Needle on. Needle beam. Here. No, it, fit, it fits. It fit, oh, lay, lays in here. Chain fits, roller. Fits. Yeah, fits right here in, inside the lower step bracket. Perfect. So, what what used to take an hour and a half can be done in about five minutes now, right? And the, and the other part that we looked at there, those hangers, that's these. And those things are on here like this. You can see this here. These are the hangers. I'm looking at no, this side. There we go. We're working in poor lighting here, okay? These are the hangers. This is what it looks like. And because they're molded in ABS, you can actually glue them in place. It's, it's perfect. Here's the crossover pipe, a new part for it. And these things are made out of ABS. And I was going to show you a little trick with that. Can I do that? We got just a minute. We got all the time in the world. Make it right. We'll go like this and then this. Well, I, I would recommend running the drill through that, of course, for the train line. Because it's going to be a little snug if you don't. Yeah, that's brought out in the instructions. Yeah, it's all there. But anyway, here you go. Here's the, the part here. But you're not, you, you look at this and you say, well, how's that going to work? This points down. It's easy. You just bend it like this. This stuff is really tough stuff. And it will. you can bend it and it will stay. I'll, I'll bend it way around here to get some spring to it. Yeah. See that? All fixed. Yeah, we really made the kit building uh, process really easy for this underbody process. Right, because you can, this stuff is really a tough material, and you can bend it around, it's not going to break, you don't have to worry about it. See? Fits right on there, on your brake, brake cylinder, on your train line here, perfect. Okay? Very nice. Yeah, there's something else about Socon, remember, you can't glue it. And so what we did, we, it, it, if you have to have something you have to fit together, so kind of raw material for that. But we're shooting it now in this material here, which is ABS, which I told you already about. It's really tough, and it's as tough as this almost, and you can glue it together, which is, is a real plus. <laughs> but with, some of the people might want to know how the Perlite car started out. Bill and I had the opportunity to go down to Independence, uh, California. We needed to do a little work on the SP-18. And while we were there, they just received one of the bodies uh, for the original Perlite car. And so it was sitting in the yards there. And so while we had some downtime while the engine was getting fired up, I decided to measure the doors on it while Bill went in the truck and took a nap. And so <laughs> when I went back to the hotel that night, I got my laptop out and drew up the CAD drawings. And the program was ready to uh, cut the tooling when we returned back to California. So that's how that car originated. 
Yeah, and it's a really neat car all by itself. And we'll show them my close up here in a minute. But this, this, these were unusual cars for unusual times because the SP ran in the Owens Valley and uh, perlite was a commodity that they needed to move and uh, that they used in plastic, right? Yeah, and plus they got to run them in unit trains so a, a guy can have, you know, six to ten of those cars in a train and it'll really make a nice uh, uh, view for, you know, going through the desert. Yeah, besides that, you know, the SP stuff was really interesting. It, it doesn't look like a real grand box car. They sit kind of high. In, in a sense, they're, they almost look like a standard gauge car, but they're small. It's a short box car, so it's cool. And they make a wonderful freelance car because, once again, it doesn't look like a real grand car. It just looks like a common box car built in the early 1900s. And so you can do a variety of things with it. And so we got more things planned for the SP in the future. Right. So anyway, we're going to get some other tooling here. Uh, let's, let's show them this thing here. Uh, all along we've had, some of, some of our tooling, you got to remember, was made in the mid-80s. Yeah. 1984, I think, it came out with our first injection molded model. Well, this tooling is old. Very old. So as tooling goes, it's really old. And so a lot of it's getting kind of hammered. So we decided we'd make a, a part here, which is got the real grand brake wheel on it. So what we're looking at, obviously, what's, what's missing off here? I already cut some parts off, it chain on me, right? But anyway, uh, I'll, I'll show you what's on here. This is a chain roller guide. We left a piece out of the center of it so you can slip a piece of chain in from the other side when you're building it. So you, that, that works, it's, it's for ease of assembly. This is the uh, ratchet and paw goes on the roof. I don't know whether that'll show up here, but it's on a slight slant, the bottom of it, so when you put it on the roof of a boxcar, the slope's about four degrees or so, what that is up there. Uh, this is the uh, bottom part of that. It makes it into a really nice, crisp assembly. You can see the detail on this brake wheel. I don't know whether it's going to show up, but it's got all the little holes around the rim. And uh, what are these things? Well, these are more crossover pipes. This is... Uh, for various cars, right? We designed that. Yeah, in fact, those crossover pipes fit most of our kits, but also for scratch builders, if you adjust your train line one way or another, one of those universal uh, crossover pipes will fit 90% of the models you're building. So it's really a welcomed uh, piece of equipment that we have here. And remember, I showed you how to bend it in that, another video, you're right? We, yeah, once again, these are made out of that ABS so right. that we can just, turn the elbows 90 degrees right. so we can hook them up to our triple valve. Right, and here we have a retainer, and the retainer has a slot in the bottom of it here, so you can glue it on the side of the car where it goes, and then the pipe can fit in the slot from the bottom. It's, it's a much, much handier to part. And this, of course, is a live lever bracket. It's just all very lacy because the tools are brand new instead of worn out. Uh, yeah, so we're not only having highly detailed car kits, but we're making them easier to build with some of these upgrades. That's it. Okay, this is a test shot. Uh, test shots are basically test shots. If you look at it, it's missing some pieces, and that's because we hadn't got the mold uh, working right yet. And that sometimes it takes days to get this stuff to run. But anyway, getting back to it, this is this is the end beam for the 0400. Now it also fits some of the, R, the DNR GW cabooses. I couldn't tell you which one, but when these things were built initially, uh, the, I believe the DNR GW got eight of them, and then they built three or so more for the, for the RGS. I forget the numbers right off. But anyway, but this is the coupler pocket covers for the model. Uh, and uh, this is a striker plate cast type, and this is a wood beam type uh, buffer block. They call that. Here's a. Uh, this is the chain for the for the obviously the brake rigging. What else we got on here? Little little brackets and stuff. These are the uh, got a diesel truck going rolling by outside, and this is. Uh, these are brackets for the cut levers. And uh, anyway, going back to this, this chain thing. Speaking of chains, I wanted to show you something else. Now this one doesn't look all that good, but I'll show you a different one. This is a chain shot. This is the caboose ladder. 
Now, if you notice, here's a chain on it. Basically, it's the same chain you saw there, but in a different colored plastic. Doesn't look so gross, and then we had the press set up right for this. So this is the this is the the caboose railing, and so here's the ladder, and there's the railing. But there's a chain in here. Now let me show you this thing. This is really trick. Where is it? It's oh, it's on the end of the model. Ah, okay. There's the here it is, desprued. And if you notice, this is one piece. Here's the chain. We'll take it out of here. See that? And look at this. It's it's strong enough to do this with. So, they, uh, once again, this is made in ABS. So, it's not like Celcon or Delrin. You can glue this stuff together. So, if you break it, well, you can fix it. But you're not going to break it because it's pretty tough stuff. And it, obviously, it fits perfect on here. And it'll allow us to paint them white and add it to the model after we got the body color painted. So, it'll make a nice, clean model. There you go. Perfect. Now, one other thing while we're looking at the end of the model here, you notice the hand, the hand grabs on here on this particular caboose have a loop at the bottom over here? Yes, I do. Well, hardly any of them had that. But the 0400 does, and I think it's a cool, cool detail. So uh, rather than have these formed up in, in Korea or in the Orient, which we don't do much of anymore anyway. I just I decided to make a jig to make that little loop on there. How long would it take you to make that by yourself from scratch? Well, it wouldn't take that long, but it'd probably take me 20 tries. <laughs> right? And uh, you wanna look at that? I probably have to do a close up on it. Okay, now this is the jig that I was using. We see it's put this on here. Just to be cool. Anyway, this is the roof grabs. You use wires to bend this stuff around. And this is the handrail. And there's a groove in here. You probably can't see it, but there is one. And so I formed the wire first around a, around a mandrel. And then it sort of round. And then I bend it and put it in here. Pull it down and bend it down. Make a 90 on both ends. Now, when you get the part out of the mold or out of here, uh, how's it, how, even if it's not formed to fit the caboose correctly, because of the holes where they are, when you put it together, it's going to form itself. Fit like a glove. Make a beautiful hand railing out of it. I think they look great. Perfect every time. Yeah. Okay. First, I bend the end of it, right? So it sits in here. Like this. This in here, like that, and then bring this around, like this, a little bit more, bring this around here like that, to where it's about 90 degrees, and bend it down. Not sure a lot easier than trying to bend them by hand. Well, there's the loop, see? Yeah, that's beautiful, Bill. So while Bill's talking to you on the phone, he's sitting there bending grab irons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all fun and games, right? Model railroad business. Something else we got here recently, we ran out of wheel sets. Yeah, and we had a hard time getting them remade by the manufacturer, but Seho came through for us once again took a little time, but uh, we made a coining tool to uh, press the wheel set itself. Then there, are, then there is a secondary operation where they get machined and bored out for the insulated bushing, and then they are pressed on the axle. So we now have uh, new coin metal rib back wheel sets. Yeah, these are the real deal. These are metal. These aren't, uh, these aren't plastic. No. And they're, they are detailed because all these old freight cars and stuff had detailed wheels. Yeah, so they all have the Denver Griffin lettering on them and the rib backs. So they're absolutely works of art. And uh, they really help with uh, uh, the rolling qualities of your rolling stock. Okay, so can you see the Griffin Denver on here? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. I don't know. I'm moving it around a little bit. And then you can see the rib back on them. Something else about these wheel sets, if you'll notice the profile is narrower 
than uh, what the old M NMRA RP25 was. These wheels work perfect on uh, on our rolling stock, and they have a wheel profile that actually looks like a real one. And it really makes a difference when you're looking at the trucks from the end of the car and tank car, so well done. Well, we got the, the 0400 caboose body about done. Once again, we're in the test shot phase, but we almost have it. Uh, just a few more minor tweaks on the end tooling, and we about have that kit done. So it's going to be up to you, Bill, to get the instructions going. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> well, here's the, here's the, uh, the roof as applied to it. Okay, here's the cupola. I told you, this trim board, you see how that doesn't quite fit down to the edge of the roof? Doesn't know the real thing either. I don't know what purpose it served. But anyhow, I'm, I modeled this cupola with the window slid open. You can see that the other side they're shut on. I don't know whether it shows up or not. I, but you can model them any way you like. And as far as the cupola is concerned, if you look at it, I made it so that it would have seats in it. You know, because you may want to have, uh, for instance, your conductor sitting over here on this side looking forward. Uh, look watching his train with the window slid open. Or you may want to have a couple of kibitzers like you or me inside the thing, Booth. Be a fun ride. And we thought about doing an interior, but... Can't see through those little bitty windows, and there's a lot of work to do in interior, a lot of expense in the tooling. So if you want to do the remainder of the interior, you, you're on your own. You're on your own, <laughs> yeah. The caboose is an Ananito, and you can have at it. But here's how, you know, here's how it fits together. It fits together real nice. And so what else we got? Well, we're going to take a little tour of the PBL shop. We'll show them how an injection molding machine works. And then we might review on how we develop the, the 0400 kit and show them some CAD drawings and, and how we do things. And we got a few pictures of the, the mill um, actually machining some of this tooling. And, and basically that'll be the what's new at PBL segment of this special narrow gauge convention Zoom meeting. Well, he's good, isn't he? <laughs> Next, we're gonna take a peek at our injection molding room here at PBL. Here we have our employee, Arno, who is running a part for another contract that we have. And for those that aren't familiar with the injector molding process, basically uh, it has a barrel that shoots plastic into the molds that we saw earlier today in uh, Bill's discourse. And uh, it, sh it melts them down to about almost 500 degrees temperature and it injects the part in this particular part about 1400 PSI and a, a plastic molded part comes out. Here's our screen. It shows all the different functions. Ours is a servo machine and so it shows all the servo RPMs, the pressure on the hydraulic lines and the temperature of the barrel. And so it's a all computerized machine and this particular part we've run 500 of them today and it's only made about two bad parts. So we can see that our productivity is uh, really high with this new equipment. Next we have a couple of photos of our milling machine cutting a mold. Here you can see the ladder mold for the 0400 caboose that we just saw plastic parts of. Basically our machine's running at 28,000 RPMs with a 5,000 in mill and it took a probably about nine hours to complete that process. Here's the SP brake shot that we saw earlier. It's cutting all the clevises and that mold time was probably about 48 hours. This is a tool, Jimmy, for the uh the drawing to make the tooling for the SP brake shot. You see there's two of them here. This was this is uh well you, you already saw the shots. I don't need to describe them. We have two different versions of the SP car and so one of them uh, is this one and this one's the other one. I can't remember which is which now. However this is what the the part is supposed to look like and uh, that's pretty much what you look like it looks like when you see it. Except what these are here, this this piece here, is a vent. That's those are vents, so that we can get the make the part run. Otherwise, it didn't work. Okay. And uh, as you can see, there's a lot of detail on these little parts here. Here's the chain. And with three D solid modeling, what you see is what you get. So I can take your drawing and turn it into a. CNC program and the milling machine will cut exactly what's on that screen. That's right. That's right. 
So here's the clevises, and you notice the back, the other side of them have have uh, pin through them. This is what you see from the bottom of the car. Very nice work, Bill. How about that 0400 caboose? Let's take a look at that. All right, I got that over here. Uh, this is the 0400, but uh, if if you notice, the ladder looks out of out of, out on the back. Well, that's because it's also another caboose. I just didn't I didn't turn that off here. That's really yeah. Real. Since that car is going to be a combination of the 0400 and the 0403. Uh, we're able to duplicate the same parts on the body drawing to save time. Right. Right. Here's another trick we pulled off too. You know, the 0400 had the the door on it from way back when. The door on it was just a blank like this. It had like a piece of masonite or something nailed over the outside of it. However, the inside of it was detailed. So if you look inside the caboose here, if I can get in here. You see the inside of the door has has the window frame in it. See it? Yep, and that's exactly how we have the parts modeled. So we can have interchangeable doors so that we can model the 0400 exactly as it is with plain panel door. But if you're modeling the 0403, then you can model the panel door on each end. Yeah, panel door is right, see? So, and then, then uh, like here too, also in the same. You see, here's the... The grab with the hoop in the bottom that we talked about. And these little parts are little tiny parts and it's going to take some manual dexterity to get them installed. But they are totally cool. So your model can look as good as that drawing with some careful work. Yeah, it can. If you notice the drawing is highly detailed. And that's what all the parts will look like, or do look like actually. Takes a little while to make a drawing like this. But the end result is worth it when you're able to assemble a kit and everything fits together very nicely. Yeah, so that that's what they look like. And uh, here we'll zoom back out. And that's it. Well, thank you for sharing your drawings, Bill. We can't wait to get this kit on market. Hopefully we can get it out in the next couple of months. And we look forward to uh, producing our next kit, which is a surprise. As you can see, it takes a lot of hard work and dedication to produce these models. Yeah, well, Jimmy, don't forget, you see the picture we got up here for you. Don't forget what your real job around here is. Weathering all these locomotives, sometimes six, eight hours a day. You're the man. <laughs> Well, it's not always work around here, Bill. Sometimes we get to have a little fun. Here's an example. Thank you for tuning in, guys. Yeah, thanks for hanging in with us. We had fun here.